Hi. 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 I'm Caitlin Sanders, your new next door neighbor. Oh, Caitlin, good to meet you. I've heard so good many too. good things about you. Oh. Welcome to Jackson <laughs> Elementary. Thank you. You need a hand? Uh, two. Okay, <laughs> no problem. Here you go. All right. So, nice. uh, how long have you been teaching sixth grade? Three years. Three years? Yeah. How long have you been teaching special ed here? <laughs> well, probably since before you were born. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like this to be hung up? Yes, please. Okay, I'll right do it over there. All right. Okay. No problem. So, here. just like this? Yeah, that would be fantastic. Okay. There you go. Hey. Okay, fantastic. Hey, okay, well, don't get too excited. We actually have a few more for you, but we'll do those later. <laughs> okay. Well, besides wanting to come yes. and say hello, yes. I need some advice. First, make sure your lesson plan is done a week in advance. Okay. Two, don't be afraid to ask administration for anything you really need. Right. And three, and this is most important, uh -huh. never, never sit in Bobby Baldwin's chair. He picks his nose and wipes it on the seat. Oh, gross. Okay. <laughs> well, Good no. to know. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, what I really wanted to come yes. and speak with you about are classroom-based strategies for children with autism. My specialty. That's what everyone around here says. Yes, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good to know. I have an autistic student right. being placed in my classroom this year, and I need help. Help, Advice. exactly. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've had some training in college, right. but I need more. Things like knowing their deficits, their strengths. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that you have come to the right place. Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> Classroom-based strategies. It's an yes. introduction. Wow. <laughs> that's great. Would you like to sit down and talk yes, about it? Yes, definitely. Oh, no, not oh. there. Not there. That, that, that's Bobby Baldwin's chair. Ooh. Okay, How about I'm good. Right here? All right, that, <laughs> we'll <we're> talk. Here. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about it. Okay. Now, two of the concerns I get asked about most are understanding autistic students' behavior mm -hmm. and identifying classroom supports and strategies. Oh, okay. Put me on the list. You and lots of teachers, mm. school psychologists, administrators. Know why? I give up. Because the more the autism prevalence rate increases, the more classrooms are becoming homes to students with autism spectrum disorders. Oh. Public schools are required by law now to meet the educational, behavioral, and social needs of these students. Mm. And even though, in most cases, this is done through special education, there are lots of general classroom-based supports and strategies that can be used to help these kids reach their maximum potential. Okay. Where do we start? In 1943. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> with a man named Leo Kanner who first described autism. Huh. Well, how did he recognize it? How did he define it? This perplexing disorder is characterized by difficulty in interacting normally with others, mm. speech, language and communication impairment, and insistence on environmental sameness, mm. stereotypic and self-stimulatory behaviors, and a variety of aberrant responses to sensory stimuli. Is that the whole list? <laughs> There's more. Oh my gosh. Some children with autism spectrum disorders have splinter skills, and others isolated and unique skills, knowledge, and abilities. Now, at the same time, it's not unusual for kids with autism to have normal physical growth and development. Mm. Our students with autism have a wide range of abilities, ranging from near or above average intellectual and communication abilities to severe mental retardation and an absence of spoken language. And the current term for describing children with autism-related disorders is autism spectrum disorders, or ASD, right? Right. ASD is used to refer to the broad range of subtypes and levels of severity that fall within the spectrum of autism and pervasive developmental disorders. Mm. Autistic disorder, childhood disintegrated disorder, Rett disorder, Asperger syndrome, pervasive development disorders, and atypical autism. I had no idea there were so many categories. <laughs> That's not all. Oh, gosh. There are other forms of autism and pervasive developmental disorders on the spectrum, but these are the primary subgroups. Hmm. And the formal reference text for diagnosis is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, right? You've done your homework. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> the DSM IVTR and also the Autism Society of America and the Federal Definition of Autism 
Now, would you like to go over some of those definitions? Most definitely. Coffee first. How about you? <laughs> sure. Perfect. Thanks. Wow, beware now. I make it strong. Mm. Strong is good. Let's go over each of the definitions of autism and then we'll discuss the major diagnostic groups. Perfect. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders defines autism spectrum disorders as a pervasive developmental disorder characterized by severe and pervasive impairment in several areas of development, social interaction skills, communication skills, or the presence of stereotyped behaviors, interests, and activities. All right, everyone, let's take out your worksheets. James, would you please take out your worksheet? No worksheet for me. No sheet. No sheet. No sheet. No sheet. No sheet. Is there something else you'd like to try today? No, no sheet. 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 All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's begin with problem number one. No sheet. No sheet. No sheet. Now these behavioral patterns appear in the first three years of life and are significantly atypical for a child's mental age or developmental level. Hmm. The Autism Society of America relies on the following definition of autism, which is closely aligned with the criteria used in the DSM-4 and Canner's original observation of autism. Autism is a complex developmental disability that typically appears in the first three years of life, the result of a neurological disorder that affects the functioning of the brain. Any other definitions? <laughs> yes. The one that's probably the most important to you as a professional in the education system. Okay. It comes from the Federal Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, of 1997. Now, although similar to the DSM-5, and Autism Society of America's definition, the federal definition or idea has unique elements. Okay. Autism means a developmental disability significantly affecting verbal and nonverbal communication and social interaction, generally evident before age three, that adversely affects a child's educational performance. Other characteristics often associated with autism are engagement in retentive activities and stereotyped movements, resistance to environmental change or change in daily routines, unusual responses to sensory experiences. The term does not apply if a child's educational performance is adversely affected primarily because the child has an emotional disturbance. A child who manifests characteristics of autism after age three could be diagnosed as having autism if the criteria above are satisfied. Wow. Learning style refers to those skills that allow a student to focus their attention and store information. Sequential versus simultaneous processing, stimulus selectivity, and attention to detail all fall under this category. A student's memory skills, including short-term, long-term, visual, auditory, rote, and meaningful memory, play a role in creating his or her learning style. So we use tests that examine students' preferences and strengths within these areas for the purpose of shaping teacher instruction. You got it. Okay, that makes sense. But keep in mind, a student's rate of performance, task pacing, incidental learning, independent work habits, and generalization skills are all factors that also need consideration when talking about the student's style. Hmm. Now this is Stephen, an oh. Asperger syndrome student who graduated from high school and went on to college. We thought Stephen was avoiding non-preferred activities because he rarely answered questions or participated during group activities. He also didn't follow teacher requests and demands. So how did the teacher deal with him? His teacher, Mr. Weiss, reached a point of major frustration. Hmm. We began discussing if Stephen should be removed from all his general education classes and placed into special education. They brought me in to consult. After we examined Stephen's learning style, the school staff learned that he had processing deficits. He also needed verbal instructions paired with visual instructions. 
So the barrier was his style of learning. Exactly. Hmm. Once we decoded this and allowed Stephen 20 to 30 seconds to access, process, and respond to information, rather than the traditional three to five second wait time usually spent in reciprocal conversation, and provided him with simple written instructions, Stephen was able to follow instructions and teacher demands and actively participate in classroom activities. So by taking the time to evaluate and understand his learning style, you... And the staff. And the staff. <laughs> developed a method of teaching that had a big impact. Success for us, but even more for Stephen. So that's it? Not all student learning styles are so easily understood. Oh. We also have to understand behavioral patterns and characteristics, uh -huh. refer to how students act on information they retrieve, and their unique way of applying this information to function. All types of instructional patterns should be observed, including adult to student, student to peer, small group, large group interchanges, the student's pattern of response to issues of reinforcement, structure, stress, and success should also be examined. Avoidance behaviors, attention-seeking behaviors, and self-stimulatory patterns should all be considered part of the student's behavioral profile. That's a very thorough examination. And it yields a great deal of critical information. Through structured observations of the student in a variety of settings, you can observe on-task and off-task characteristics, flexibility in moving from one activity to the next, and any type of event that triggers impulsive or compulsive behavior. Got it. We also need to examine and consider eye, hand, and foot dominance, as well as the ability to cross midline in order to determine perceptual abilities in fine and gross motor skills. These areas can easily be observed by having the student visually track a favorite item, such as a toy or a book, catch or kick a ball, or draw or write something. Any patterns of oral and written perseverance should also be noted. Anything else? The strategies a student uses to problem solve must be looked at and noted. Strategies? Yes, 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 yes. The, the, the techniques or rules that a student uses to complete tasks independently. Students with autism and Asperger's syndrome frequently persist in using unsuccessful strategies simply because they have no other strategies for the given situation. Oh, so we need to help these kids learn the difference between effective and ineffective problem-solving skills. Absolutely. Yeah. The ability for a student to follow written or oral instructions is another important component that involves strategic thinking. You mean we have to figure out the types of strategies a student uses and whether the student can learn or develop new strategies? That's right. Now, as I said, sometimes a student approaches an activity or task very strategically, mm -hmm. but often uses strategies that are ineffective or inappropriate. Sure. I've observed and worked with many students who were unable to organize or prioritize multiple level instructions. But when the teacher gave small, brief instructions, the students were successful at completing the tasks. So sometimes it's just a matter of taking small steps. That makes sense. Not only do we need to consider strategies, we need to examine and consider the type of metacognitive strategies that a student applies. What are metacognitive strategies? <laughs> OK. That's skills like self-talk, self-monitoring, and self-correction. You have to keep in mind that students with autism frequently do not pass the developmental stages necessary to develop metacognitive skills. Take, for example, a typically achieving preschooler who is pretending to make food out of Play-Doh. Let's make pasta. I cut the pasta. Put on plate. So, as she used Play-Doh to make spaghetti, she verbally gave herself directions by saying first she has to make pasta, then she needs to cut the spaghetti, and then she has to put it on her plate. Sequencing. Right? Pretty typical. Okay. But most students with autism may never rehearse the usual developmental activities, and therefore 
They must experience and learn them through direct teaching. So all of these strategies, learning styles, patterns of behavioral characteristics, and student-specific strategies, must be examined and incorporated into an educational program for students with autism or Asperger's syndrome. One hundred percent right. It's fundamental. When creating an educational program for students with ASD, their unique characteristics present unique challenges for administrators and practitioners. Mm. An effective classroom needs to include a physical structure that enhances learning opportunities and instructional approaches that facilitate learning, language acquisition, behavior management, social skills, and academic goals. Then we can apply many of the basic principles of effective instruction that are used within the general education classroom as we work with students with autism and Asperger's syndrome. Oh, wow. How do you define an effective strategy? With a whole lot of thought. <laughs> <laughs> we develop strategies that provide structure and predictability to the learning process allow students to anticipate task requirements and setting expectations, and teach a variety of skills across content areas in the natural environment, enhancing the likelihood of generalization. Brenda, this has been so helpful. <laughs> really, I understand a lot more about autism spectrum disorders and how to better understand and assess the special needs of those kids in my classroom but you still want more information about the specific strategies and supports that you can use for those students with autism and Asperger's syndrome, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> You're good. And unfortunately, I'm also out of time. Oh. This brings us to the end of classroom-based strategies for students with ASD, an introduction. But I have more questions. And they'll be answered in part two. All right, part two. I'll be here. Me too.